the first moment I ever wanted to write was probably somewhere in the fifth grade. My little Southern Californian Christian elementary school, about one classroom per grade, was rather well-rounded education-wise. We got a basic course in all the major areas of study, though notably without much on evolution, and even had quite the extracurricular program. Among these was art, expressed in an art fair held at the end of every year, working with and showing off various mediums, including watercolor, colored pencils, mild acrylics, and a few other things of a more physical, textile nature. I myself was never very good at art. Try as I might, I could never really understand colors and textures and shapes with my hands. I did get two honorable mentions at an art fair, which were more than just participation awards, but my subject matter was usually not very Christian. I remember once doing video game fan art. They called it fantasy, and that's as far as they'd take it. But I like going to the art fair and looking at everyone else's pieces. It may have been in some ways the beginning of a fondness for art museums, because I loved seeing if my friends were there and if they placed, as well as just seeing all the other stuff people did when I couldn't myself. The sixth graders at my school had to do the special art project called Larger Than Life. Students were required to take an object, any object they wanted, and blow it up to either five or ten times its original size. I dreaded the moment, mostly because I was in fact terrible at art, and why would you expect someone like that to stick to accurately blow up an object to that size? Uh, I have no fear saying mine, a guitar pick, was done mostly with help from my dad or grandfather. But it was one of those things that still intrigued me at the art fair. When I was in fifth grade, I had a friend who was one year older than me, and so had an entry in that larger-than-life category. Her family was friends with my family, and so we often hung out at large events and parties. So when I recognized her name at the art fair, I was suitably intrigued. Not only because she was a good artist, but because she had done something with the art project that I'd never seen before. She did a book, blown up five times its size and standing about four feet tall, done specially designed cover and a unique little blurb to go on the back. Even before the writing th part of it, I thought it sounded cool. It was about these anthropomorphic cats that went in space, went around in space trying to find these special items to save the universe, or something like that. I can't remember the specific details of it. But it was about the time frame of my getting into the Harry Potter series, and found myself immediately a total fan of the idea. It just sounded really cool, and I wanted to see if such a thing existed. Uh, so I found my friend, and I asked her if she had based it off a series she knew. Was it an actual series and title? Something that she just came up with for the project? What was the inspiration behind that book cover? The answer was she was writing the first draft of the book in question. I was floored. I was 11, she was like 12, and she was already freaking writing a book about these cats in space. It was something that blew my mind. I was in grade school when J.K. Rowling was the youngest writer I'd ever heard of, and she was still middle-aged. So to hear about my friend who wasn't even a teenager writing a book, I just thought this was the coolest thing ever. It was the first time I ever had the idea of writing as this thing I wanted to do. I wanted to make my own universes like that. I wanted to make my own characters and have them go on all these amazing adventures. I wanted to make my own worlds and write stories. I just thought it was the best thing ever. I did have some inclinations beforehand. I wrote what could be described as fan fiction long before I knew about it writing self-insert stories about video games I'd played. I stapled pieces of paper together and scribbled down some loosely connected ideas. I was proud of this book that had unfinished ideas and some ten or so blank pages. But being so young, for me, it was just play. Never anything really serious involved. The funny thing about this was I asked my friend if I could read her book. She said she'd bring it over the next time our families got together. Of course, the next time that happened was a few months down the road, and both of us totally forgot about the book. Well, my ideas of writing didn't disappear so easily. Whatever sixth grade literature curriculum was a series of creative writing prompts once per month that we had to finish with short stories. I remember the first few times I did it were really weird. I remember one in particular was basically a self-insert fan fiction of a video game I really liked at the time. <laughs> but it was awesome, and it had some of the beginnings of those writing urges that I had. And even with the weird ones, I do remember getting all A's on those creative writing assignments, so it must have paid off at least a little bit. I also remembered having these little stuffed animal toys called Beanie Babies. I remember having a few favorites, mostly cats, because I went through a major phase of cats as my favorite animals that lasted almost to the high school. Uh, and I had a few old play sets where I would take the Beanie Babies and make them go on all these fantasy adventures. 
really wasn't too far off from what my friend did in writing, and the moment I figured that out, I went from playing with them to writing stories about them. I still play it every once in a while, just to keep the imagination going, but my attentions, for the most part, shifted. I did manage to remember sometime in seventh grade about my friend's book. She had brought it over to the house of another friend of the family when we were all over there for dinner. Now, I wasn't seeing the original draft anymore, but I saw her with this open notebook filled with paper and asked her if she was doing homework. Uh, she replied, no, it was her own book. I remembered the whole art fair thing and asked if I could see it because I remembered it so long ago and had forgotten about it. If I was amazed by the pure concept of my friend's idea, it was another thing entirely to see it in progress. It was 324 pages of size 14 point double spaced work filled with purple pearls all over the place. It was still a thing of beauty to me. I remember reading through the book fascinated, even though some of the paragraphs were over a page in length. I mean, we're talking about a character's hair being described exactly the way it would or would not sit on shoulders. I became engrossed in the character details, the wide open spaces of the desert planet of the first few chapters, and I loved the story. I also remember one other thing. The pages were filled with notes. Back when I had initially voiced my interest at the art fair, she had recently finished the first draft. Two years later, she had filled every page with notes, between the lines on the side of the page, even drawn on the text itself. It was just filled with edits, and yet I didn't see it as messy. I saw it as a labor of love, or at least a product of many years of hard work and dedication. Even the process fascinated me when it came to writing. And seeing the work and the dedication put into this work, which much larger than the simple stories I've been writing, the flame was lit yet again. It was about this time that I began my first major work, which I christened the Chronicles of Arkin. It was about this boy from a town in this fictional country of Arkin, who would discover by accident a plot by this evil lord to take over and steal the magic of this fictional country. He would go around defeating the evil lord's forces with a handful of companions and would learn the country's secrets, eventually using them to defeat the lord in combat. Yes, it was very much based on role-playing games, video games, but that's what I was into that time. And still I am, and some of them have very fascinating storylines. I think I went through about 20 or so different incarnations of the Chronicles of Arkham between 2005 and 2009. It was one of those ideas that I'd suddenly have the urge to write and have this amazing new idea of how to go about it, go for 60 to 100 pages, and then suddenly everything would just dry up and nothing would work. I might even guess that I would have probably written half a million or so words by the time I turned 17, simply because I would pile it all up and throw it away to start afresh. A few things stayed constant. I always inserted things I loved. Two characters were dogs. One a wolf because I loved wolves and dogs instead of cats now, and one a German Shepherd dog because I thought that they were the closest thing to a wolf that I could possibly own. I always had a forest because I loved going camping up in the San Bernardino Mountains by our home and loved walking around our home. Sometimes I included a dragon, but always an Eastern-inspired dragon because I loved the big snakes whenever we went to the zoo. But every version had something different. One had a talking tiger with fire magic. One was straight medieval, that sort of thing. Sometimes even the world itself was different. Either how magic was done, or what character appeared, or what circumstances, or even the whole format of the world itself. It was like a jigsaw puzzle more than anything else. Putting in pieces and trying to see what fit where with what circumstances my mind decided to pull out. I don't really understand why none of it worked, but every time it was something different. This one didn't have enough detail, that one had a shoddy romance, another had a weakly pulled off villain, another almost went into village territory, even though I didn't understand what that was yet. I was rather pure and most internet lingo until I was almost done with high school. But nothing settled right about it, none of them were ever finished. I think the closest I got was about half done. And even then, something wasn't quite right. I don't really quite understand why I kept going with it either. Drive probably has something to do with it. Being so persistent about making it my own, I would work on it even when the going seemed tough. Stubbornness, too, only taking setbacks lying down for a day or two when I realized I didn't quite want to give up on the idea just yet. That being said, while I would like to have an epic like the Chronicles of Arkham someday, I don't think it's in me. It would either turn out more like an RPG game or very much like the things I didn't like about it. As I've gone through so many incarnations of it, nothing feels right anymore. I remember the mother during those times scolding me quite heavily. 
I was printing out something like 20 or 30 pages a week of non-school related material because I was obsessed with seeing it in print, only to throw it in the recycle a few weeks later when it ground to a halt. An all too common problem in our house was I would have had a paper due in a few days and we'd always been buying an ink cartridge or printer paper at the last second because I'd recently used the last of it on my perpetually unfinished book. Because of this, I don't think any of them survive very long in our house. I also think that's what contributed to me stopping work on it eventually because nothing quite looked like it meshed well. I was beginning to think I couldn't get this writing thing right. The artist who crumples the paper and throws it over his shoulder isn't so glamorous an idea when you write a novel and you realize you're throwing out reams of paper at a time. I probably would have stopped entirely if it wasn't for something that happened in 2008. And I was frequently in the internet fairly often and found my way to DeviantArt, a rather general art and literature site first created mostly for the purpose of showing off art to other people. I think I was looking at pictures on Google when I found it looking for the source of a piece of art. I was immediately enamored by the concept, so I joined. I was really into wolves still am for the most part, and found a lot of artists I like on that side who drew wolves. A rather large subset of that was anthropomorphic art, with three artists in particular garnering the focus of my attention for their designs. One was closer to humanoid, one was closer to feral, and one was somewhere in the middle. I had no clue at the time of what that was. My favorite video game series contained an anthropomorphic bandicoot, but if you asked me what either of those words meant, I wouldn't have been able to, able to give you a good definition of either. I just saw wolves and werewolves and thought, cool, I like this stuff. But around 2008, a few of them began to complain they weren't receiving a lot of views due to the content of their art and were moving to a new site for affinity. I watched first one go, then the second, then the third, and with my three favorite artists gone, DeviantArt didn't hold too much for me anymore at that time. I thought it over and was kind of hesitant about it, but I eventually followed them over and logged in because I was already kind of interested in anthropomorphic art, and I still wanted to see more of their art. And at the first, say for work, glance, it appeared the site was more of what I saw in DeviantArt, just with different species thrown into the mix. I think creating an account for Affinity and logging in was my first time seeing explicit rated artwork. I don't know if it's because I'm not a particularly sensual person to begin with, being more Demisexual, only sexually attractive if there's emotional bond being established than anything else. But it's kind of gross to look at. Of course, some po people might see that as sensible, both the apparent lack of apparent pornography and treating a partner right. It took me a bit of time, but I found out how to make it where the explicit rated artwork was all gone and was able to browse in relative comfort. Kept the mature rated stuff because of mild violence, but I was still relatively pure at the time, even if I was finding the other type of note of mature, no sex, but still sensual, increasingly more interesting. It was through this com community that I learned a lot about the negative opinions of furries and people who liked anthropomorphic artwork in general. I heard about the bad, read, naughty stuff that happened at conventions, the predilections for not safe for work art, the overall sexual nature, stuff like that one CSI episode. For some dumb reason, my mind thought, it can't be bad. I was watching a few artists for a while and didn't see this stuff until I came to the news site. And of course, out of sight, out of mind regards to the Fur Affinity profile. Thankfully, one of my friends in high school in 2009 decided she was interested in it too. And we decided to go to a nearby furry convention over the summer. I don't know why my brain works like that, but I'm certainly glad it did. As I'm pretty sure the genesis of all my major ideas came from that particular moment. My friend and I went to Califer in 2009, the summer just after my junior year, with my parents taking us and spending the day somewhere else in Anaheim. The convention was in a hotel, taking up a few large conference rooms and a hallway, with some activity spilling out into a lobby bar area. The effect was, as soon as we got into the hotel, there were a bunch of people dressed up as different animals, or wearing cat ears or dog tails. My friend and I went down the hallway, already filled with suits and artists before we even wandered into the main rooms, we got in line to receive our badges and began to explore. It's probably one of the more jarring experiences of my life, and I say that in a good way. I'm a major introvert, and I do not like being around huge crowds of people for long periods of time. But I swear I have never met a nicer group of people. The people in costumes were so, so open to me with my camera taking photos like a tourist. They were posing for dynamic shots. 
I even met one quadruped suit. Someone managed to make a suit where they bent over and walked like a four-legged animal. It looked like a massive wolf that came up and nosed my hand for pets. My friend was an artist, and she enjoyed walking around the artist end, talking to the various people there. And people really respected your space. There were so many people, in suits and out, who were open to hugs, but they would not hug you unless you were okay with it and they had gained your permission. It became a time of debunking some of those myths. The not safe for work stuff was kept to one corner of the artist and was not allowed out to that area. The whole thing was highly regulated and was no different from my friends' experiences at places like Comic-Con. And no one would want to have sex in a suit because most people apparently pay $1,200 for one and don't want to ruin it. Many need intensive care in even the slightest situations of wear and tear. Why would you want to destroy that? I honestly swear the experiences changed me for the better. They made me realize I couldn't just base my opinions purely off of what other people had said. That I needed to really look into things first before I make any of these judgments. And it's a situation that occurred multiple times of my life in various different contexts. This is a group that was somewhat reviled by the media by the time that I had found them. The actuality was nothing like what the stuff with the CSI episode had portrayed. Different didn't mean depraved, a lesson that I probably really needed to learn coming from a 70, semi-conservative Christian congregation that occasionally defaulted to that. Though certainly the depraved stuff was still there, don't get me wrong. Really though, the entire thing smells like a rose but looks like a reflesia, one ugly flower that smells like a rotting corpse. That is to say, from a certain perspective, it's still ugly, but... Not as bad as everyone thinks if you're not taking into account just the surface. Probably better phrased by the old adage, don't jug a, j a book by the cover. At least with that activity, the bad stuff usually stays behind locked doors. And so in 2009, I began a new novel entirely. I ditched the Chronicles of Arkin and made a story about a boy who hears stories about werewolves, but wonders if they're really true. He also feels alone, feeling different and unsure if he fits in. He decides to make something of himself by deciding seriously on this undertaking. He sets off on a journey to uncover the mysteries about it, and ends up not only learning some things about himself, but begins to change the minds of people by uncovering the truths. This is my first novel, Night of the Silver Moon. Something different happened in this time. I not only had an idea, I had a purpose. I think a purpose is good in writing. It doesn't have to be based on lofty motives, but it certainly makes a difference to write something that has some driving force behind it. You put yourself more into it if you feel yourself invested in the payoff. Here, the purpose was placing my own feelings of insecurity and difference from others and making a story about finding somewhere I belonged. In some senses, then, it's very difficult to write without some sort of social commentary. I think you can, but the process is harder for me for some reason without being based on something that means something to me. It doesn't have to be direct, either. I don't identify as a furry the same way as I did back in 2009, but using anthropomorphic characters allowed me to state my opinions in a more allegorical sense, which in many ways ended up being what Night of the Silver Moon is, a statement on feeling ostracism of the other and why that was wrong and counterproductive, told through a fantasy story about a boy who can't put his finger on why the stories of the werewolf legend just don't make sense. Now, I don't claim that all my novels are from lofty motives. I think that's nearly impossible because if only a few people can really be and remain lofty in nature. We're flawed human beings, but if writing can point out the flaws and hope to serve even as a warning, it's worth something. Lofty motives don't have to be intentional. Sometimes they're just observances about life that creep in every once in a while. There's one more minor obstacle to overcome before I would say I truly became a writer. I wrote the first draft of Night of the Silver Moon over three months in late 2009. It's about 50,000 words long and 90 or so pages in length. I obsessively printed it off because I was so happy I finished it and put it in a folder, my first time doing so in a while, and the first time I actually felt justified doing so. Sometime at the beginning of 2010, I ended up doing some room cleaning and the folder got lost in the shuffle. But I had the book on a computer file and was about to go back over and edit it. I keep most of my work on... USB stick drives. Easily portable, extremely easy to use, and it allows me to take the damn thing everywhere. Back in 2009, I also had a laptop I took with me everywhere. It had multiple purposes. I did schoolwork on it, I wrote on it, I did research on it, I had games on it. It was a multi-purpose thing. 
For writing, I had my work on the USB stick drives that stuck out to the side of the laptop. And because I was restless and constantly searching for new places to work to revert boredom, I would carry this thing all over the house, depending on my mood. Well, one night I did some work on the USB and proceeded to stay up very late playing games on the laptop while watching TV. It was about 3 o'clock or so in the morning and the rest of the house was already asleep. I noticed the late hour for my spot in the living room, mostly because TV programming in the early hours of the morning is either news or sponsored programs, a.k.a. 30-minute advertising, and was about to go to bed. The way my house is arranged, the living room has two exits to the kitchen. One is a direct entrance, while the other is a hallway that makes a sharp left. My room is on the right after the hallway opens up into the kitchen area. I went into the kitchen, turned off the kitchen and hallway lights, then went back to the living room and turned off the living room lights, deciding to use the light from the laptop screen to navigate back to my room. In hindsight, that was a poor mistake. I navigated the first left turn through the hallway fine, but I took the right turn into my room too sharply. I bumped my side into the wall and the laptop hit the doorway. It was a small cracking sound, and I realized that while the computer was fine, the stick drive sticking out the side had taken the brunt of the impact. At first, the damage seemed minimal. The drive was merely slightly bent, and I almost didn't sweat it. But I decided to double-check and attempted to open up the drive. The drive was in the laptop, but for some reason the contents wouldn't read. The USB opened, but not a single file or folder showed. I tried taking it out and putting it back in, and turning off the laptop and turning it back on, the old fix for almost any computer issue. But the computer couldn't find any files on the USB. I began to sweat now. I decided maybe the USB port on the laptop were broken. Fine, as there were two other available ports, and went back to the desktop computer. It was one of those nights where it was just asleep, and so I shook the desktop awake and inserted the USB into the desktop where I knew the port worked. But to no avail. Nothing worked out there, either. I went back and forth between the laptop and the desktop until almost four in the morning, and discovered it really was the drive that was broken and not the port. The laptop was fine, thank God, but all my... All my writing work was on that USB, and it was all gone, including the draft. <coughs> so 2010 already was starting out as a terrible year for my writing life. I had no energy after losing this thing that I was really proud of. I lost three months' worth of work and my first completed project. And since I didn't remember any of the details, I had nothing to work off of anymore. Trying to redo the task seemed more daunting than rewarding, particularly with nothing to go off of. No notes, no outlines, nothing. All of it was lost on the now broken USB. I still use the laptop, but now mostly for schoolwork and video games. I at least learned two valuable lessons. First off, was now that I took the CS now I took the USB out before moving the laptop anywhere. Secondly, whenever I did a project, I had a very large assortment of notes, handwritten and typed and printed out, so that I would always remember what happened. In the summer of 2010, I had to do some room cleaning, because I'm often a lazy slob who works under the philosophy of, I know where everything is, so it's not messy. Of course, such a response doesn't fly when you're 18 and living under your parents' roof, so I was eventually subject to room cleaning. In my cleaning, I unearthed, of all things, the draft of Night of the Silver Moon that I had printed out a few months before. Every page was there, all the text of the original first draft. To this date, it is one of two times I went from wanting to cry to laughing out loud with relief. The second time was actually in early in 2019, when I thought I had failed the statistics exam in college. But this time I had something to go off of, and so I could start again. I protected that new draft obsessively. I made sure I knew where it was every day. Summer began, and I took notes of how the original draft progressed. When we went on vacation, I took the draft and the notes and worked on the second draft every night in the hotel room. I finished the quote-unquote second draft late in 2010, this time with a fuller and more complete version than I had originally. I felt a lot better than I did with the original one, too, though I had to go through hell and back to get the damn thing done. I would say I officially became a writer back in 2012, when, a few days before my 20th birthday, my book was self-published and released via Amazon's Create Space. Emails to niche publishing houses garnered no interest, repeatedly getting thank you but try again some other time. 
Throughout 2011, I would request proof copies of the book and would take it to school with me, looking through the printed copies and editing them as much as I possibly could, then went home and made the corrections and did the whole process again. So on my 20th birthday, I was able to celebrate my accomplishment with friends and family, gain an extra birthday present to myself in the form of a positive review from one of my cousins. Biased, to be sure, but something I appreciated all the same, considering how much trouble it had taken to get there. I am happy to report that the first edition of The Night of the Silver Moon made $300 in profits. Today it has been approximately 10 years since I started that first draft that I thought I lost late that night. Since then I've accumulated more than half a million words of written work. And despite the challenges that have resulted and the problems that I faced, I wouldn't have it any other way. While I'm a bit more careful about my work lately, I look forward to every new project with the same eagerness and fervor that it's brought.